Welcome back to this series of videos on the hidden Markov model. We're in part five, motivating and describing the way in which a hidden Markov model uh, is notated and how we reason with it. So when we last were just talking, we were talking about the observable Markov model. An observable Markov model, model is notable because of the different parameters that are required in order to define it. One of those parameters is the set of states. And so in this example, the state transition diagram, there are four states. Another required parameter to describe an observable Markov model is the state transition probability. What's the probability, given that you're in one state, that you're gonna to move to another state? A state transition diagram like this has those probabilities sort of built into them by assumption because of the arrows. For example, there's a 100% chance of moving from A to B if you're in A. If you're in C, there's a 50% chance of moving to A or moving to D. The final thing that's required to define an observable Markov model is the probability of starting in a particular state. So this st state di transition diagram gives us a lot of information about an observable Markov model. It has four states, and maybe we would get a sequence of observations that looks like state A, state B, state C, moving in a circle, then going to A again, so state A, state B, state C, and then this time going from state C, maybe we go to state D. And because once you're in state D, you can only transition to state D again, we would stay in state D until we're done observing our states. So the Markov model has a sequence of beats, some sort of temporal movement from state to state, and we observe which state we're in. So that the nature of observing which state that we're in is why it's called an observable Markov model. We know, we can tell which state we're in. And this is an abstract idea, but if we apply it to different kinds of situations like the strands of a DNA sequence or the sequence of things that are purchased from a vending machine, we actually can observe those and come up with a model that identifies, well, what is the probability that if you had an A on the rung of your DNA sequence, that the next rung would be C? We can observe it and we can come up with a model that predicts those things. The thing is, is that there are reasons why you might not be able to observe those states, and that's the rationale for having a hidden Markov model. There are lots of cases when you can't actually observe the states that you're interested in, but you can see the effect of being in the state. And those, that is the uh, relaxation of constraints that lends themselves to the hidden Markov model. So let me motivate this um, and explain where we're going. Let's, now, while there are more realistic states, there are more realistic situations where you can't observe the hidden state, this is not one of them. This is an example to motivate what a hidden Markov model can be used for. So let's imagine that there's a person behind a curtain that is flipping a coin. And each time they flip a coin, they observe what is on the coin, heads or tails, and calls out through the curtain. So that the set of observations that someone on the other side of the curtain observes is not the coin itself, but what the person calling out from behind the curtain says that they see. So for example, in a series of T observations, we would have O1, O2, O3, up to OT, and each one of those observations would be hearing heads or tails being called out through the curtain. Okay, so a good question we could ask is, well, how do we go about modeling this situation? Do we know for sure that the coin on the other side is a fair coin? And by fair coin, I mean it comes up heads or tails equally. And can we assume that the caller is faithfully calling out what they're observing on the coin across the curtain. These are additional layers of ambiguity that are introduced by virtue of not being able to observe the coin or the results. Here's one possible state model that we could use to describe what's happening. And let me uh, motivate this, and then we'll change the way that we draw our state model to consider other possibilities. So for starters, what the state model assumes is that we are going to model the scenario as having one fair coin, well, one coin, on the other side of the curtain. And when we're in state one, it means that we are observing the heads, or that we have heard heads being called out. And that with some probability, when we flip the coin, we're going to be in the head state again. And with some other probability, one minus the probability of heads, we're going to move to the tail state, and tail will be called out. If we're in the tail state, there's some probability of heads of moving back to the head state, and one minus the probability of heads of staying in the tail state. 
So this two-state model reflects whether there's a heads or a tails on the top of the coin, and the transition between the two states is based on the fairness of the coin. If it's a fair coin, then the probability of heads is 50%, and the probability of one minus probability of heads is also 50%, and so there's an equal probability of seeing a heads or a tail on any single observation. So this might generate a sequence of observations O1 to OT, for example, H, T, T, and eventually H, and that would indicate that we're in state one, then we're in state two, then we're in state two again, and finally our last observation places us back in state one. Pretty straightforward state model, very similar to a hidden Markov model. In fact, you can pretty much call this a hidden Markov model because what we observe, the heads or the tails, is exactly what's happening on the, on the other side of the curtain. So let's consider changing this model a little bit so that we have one state. This state is the state of having a coin red. So when we're in state one, it means we're going to have an observation of the coin. And with some probability of heads, given we've got coin one, we're gonna hear heads called out. And with some probability of tails, one minus the probability of heads, given we're flipping coin one, we're gonna hear tails called out. And then so in this model, every time we transition, there's no other state to transition to. So we're in state one, we stay in state one, because it reflects more of the fact that we're taking a reading, and then the thing that we re read is being dictated after we're um, landing in that state. So if we st see observation one, two, three, and T, and we hear heads, tail, tail, heads, each time we know that we're in state one, because there's only one state in our model, but what is being called out is gonna be called out dependent on whether um, there's a heads or a tails on the coin. Again, if the probability of heads, given we're flipping coin one, is 50%, then the probability of tails is one minus 50%, or also 50%. So if we have an unbiased coin, this model works fine. It helps to um, explain what is happening when we see a sequence of observations. But because this coin is being flipped behind a curtain, one thing we don't know is whether there's one coin or two coins being flipped. And perhaps one of those coins is a fair coin, but the other coin is not a fair coin. And when we hear heads and tails being called out, we don't know which coin is necessarily being flipped. Okay, this is a different possible interpretation of what's happening behind the curtain. And we can model that using an extension of this particular model. So if we look at the state transition diagram in this case, our state one and our state two correspond to coin one being flipped or coin two being flipped. And when we flip coin one or coin two, we're going to call out heads or tails based on the, on the um, bias of that coin. After we flip one coin, we'll consider whether or not we want to flip the same coin or we want to flip a different coin. And so if we see a sequence of observations, O1 to OT, and it's heads, tails, tails, heads, we don't actually know which coins were being flipped. It's possible that those observations could have been generated by the sequence of being in state one and having heads called out, then transitioning to state two and having tail called out, and then transitioning to state two again, having tails called out, and eventually, in the last observation, transitioning to state one, having heads called out. The transition probabilities of moving from one coin to the other coin are different than the probability of calling out heads or tails given the particular coin that we flipped. We have a fairness probability for coin one, that's the probability of heads given coin one, and a different fairness probability for coin two, the probability of heads given coin two. So we could have one fair coin and one unfair coin, and we could um, flip them um, one at a time and transition back and forth based on this model. Well, this should beg the question, why is it just two coins behind there? Why couldn't you have a three coin state transition diagram in which you have three coins and there's a probability of flipping one of three coins on each turn and the probability of flipping coin one and then flipping coin three is dictated by a transition probability from state one to state three. And the probability of flipping coin three after you've just flipped coin three is also governed by a probability distribution of moving from three to three, represented in this diagram by A33. Each time you land in a state, 
you look up the fairness probability of that particular coin and you call out heads or tails based on what that coin uh, landed on. So in this case, there are three different fairness properties for each coin. Coin one can be 50-50, coin two can be 75-25, and coin three can be 25-75, biased for or against heads or tails. So in this case, we might have a sequence of observations O1 to OT, and we might see heads, tails, tails, heads, but we really don't know which state we were in when we generated these. We might have been in state one, flipped a coin and gotten heads, moved to state three, flipped a coin and gotten tails, moved to state two, gotten tails, and eventually come back to state one and gotten heads. That's a possible way that we could model what's happening behind the curtain. Well, what are some advantages and disadvantages of these different um, interpretations of what's happening behind the curtain? Well, we have to figure out what they are so that we can choose which model we want to represent the world. One thing we can observe is that model one has one unknown parameter. That unknown parameter is the probability of getting the heads given that you're, in, you're flipping coin one. That's going to be some number between 0 and 1, probability between 0 and 1. And we know that the probability of flipping tails is 1 minus that. So it's completely determined by this one unknown that we've got. When we move into the second model, the model where we have two particular coins behind the curtain, we don't just have two, two unknowns now. Of course, we do have two unknowns, the unknown of getting a heads if we flip coin 1 and the unknown of a heads if we flip coin 2. That's two unknowns. But we also have the unknowns of whether, given that we're in state one, we're going to move to state two. And given that we're in state two, whether we're going to move back to state one. That's two additional unknowns. The unknowns about whether we're going to um, stay within a state are constrained by the probability of transitioning states, because it's going to be one minus the probability of moving from state two to state one. So the two coin model has a total of four unknowns, the probability of the coin and the probability of transitioning between states, or more specifically, the probability of heads and the probability of changing states. The other probabilities that are part of this model are determined by those four unknowns. Finally, if we move into the model that has three states, there are nine unknowns. The three straightforward ones are the three probabilities of getting heads given each of the coin that we're flipping, so that's three. And then we additionally have the probability of moving between state one, two, and three. That's a total of six probabilities of moving between from one to two and from one to three. Those two probabilities necessarily mean that the probability of staying in the, in the original state is one minus the sum of those two probabilities. So total, in a three-state model, we have nine unknowns, three probabilities of heads and six probabilities of state transitions. All of those models are equally uh, applicable to modeling the situation that we find ourselves in. Model one is the simplest. It has one unknown and presumably would be the easiest to learn. Model three can, at least theoretically, model a much more complicated world. It can model a world in which there are three coins with different biases and a particular pattern of switching between them. On the other hand, if there actually is only one coin behind the curtain, Model 3 is going to take a lot longer to train, and we're going to find that the probabilities of heads for each of those three coins better be exactly the same, and the probability of switching between those three virtual coins, which are actually one coin, should be completely equal at the end of the day. But we have nine unknowns that we have to train our model on, and so that'll take a lot more data. It's hard to know which one we want to choose, but introducing these different ways of representing the system are an important setup for understanding how the hidden Markov model works. In the next lecture, what I would like to do is introduce an alternative way of thinking about a hidden Markov model of instead of using a coin, we'll use a different, um, a different metaphor. Thank you for your attention.